right. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me uh, this year. And it's fantastic to see people in person. Uh, probably we've all had uh, several years of uh, Zoom conferences, so it's amazing to be able to look anywhere I want in this room. And uh, I hope you do take the opportunity to interrupt whenever you want or ask questions whenever you want. Uh, it's a nice opportunity. So. We've uh, seen a lot today about uh, genetics and genomics. This talk is not about this, although we also do this kind of thing. This is about biomarkers from medical imaging data. And as the previous speaker was saying, indeed, one of the main problems we face is when we have data that is heterogeneous. So in this talk, I want to show you examples of the work we're doing in the lab uh, at Lausanne University Hospital and show you solutions to this heterogeneity problem, both in a centralized learning uh, case and in the federated learning case. First, I want just to illustrate that machine learning is everywhere in medical imaging, and by everywhere I mean from image acquisition all the way to prognosis. So here's a, a few examples of where uh, we're doing research uh, using machine learning. The first is uh, in image acquisition. So this is a project with uh, with uh, Ruth von Heswick and Matthias Struba at uh, the University of Lausanne and Lausanne University Hospital as well, the team that is specialized in cardiovascular MR. And then the question we ask here is, can we use machine learning type approaches and black box optimization approaches to improve, new, improve image acquisition? And one of the problems you have often in cardiovascular imaging, but in other types of imaging, is that you want to remove the fat. So how can you program a magnetic resonance imaging machine such that you remove the fat from the image? So here's an example. Uh, of the results we uh, recently got with our method. So this is a knee, and the, you see in the, in the middle here, you see that it's completely dark. That's because our pulse has removed the fat. So this pulse here, this image was acquired using a pulse that is really optimized automatically. So of course, there's a lot of hu human expertise as well, but this is really uh, the kind of stuff that we can do with machine learning. Uh, more classically, it's also used for differential diagnosis. This is when you have two uh, patients or uh, two diseases that look very much the same. They have the same symptoms, but they're not the same. So an example is a multiple sclerosis, where if you have people that come to the hospital with a migraine, they have a lot of the same symptoms that people with MS have. So how do you know whether they have migraine or MS? Well, it turns out that uh, several people, mostly at the NIH around Danny Reich, discovered that in multiple sclerosis, you have lesions that have a vein in the middle, whereas if the diseases uh, are not multiple sclerosis, they tend to not have a vein in the middle. This is a probability, right? But in general, if you look at the, the lesions, you find lesions that have a vein. If you have more lesions with a vein than lesions without a vein, then it tends to be multiple sclerosis. And vein, no vein, very much like cats and dogs, hot dog, no hot dog. You know uh, what I'm talking about. This is really a computer vision problem. So this is an example of some work we did with the people at Siemens as well a while ago. Uh, so this is a classifier that tells you, you know, whether this lesion has a vein in the middle or not. And if you have many veins, then probably you have MS. So this is working uh, reasonably well. Another approach, and this I'll, I'll go a bit more about this, is to determine intervention eligibility. So you have a patient that comes in, here's the example of stroke, and you want to know very quickly whether this person you should give a drug or whether you should give a thrombectomy. So thrombectomy is a mechanical procedure, it's a surgery where you will remove the clot from the brain to restore blood flow. And you need to do this very quickly. So here's an example uh, of a map like this that tells you roughly where the infarct is located and how can you, uh, you know, whether you should remove this, uh, this or not. This is just an example in an acute care setting, but you have many more examples where you would determine inter uh, intervention eligibility. Another one, actually, an example is from this drug Aduhelm, which was recently approved. Um, for uh, Alzheimer's disease, the first drug that is approved. This, however, has severe side effect of microbleeds, so you need to make sure that people don't have too many microbleeds to start with. And as you, as you go on, you want to monitor the treatment to see that they don't develop more microbleeds. So this is an example. And treatment monitoring is also a place where these biomarkers are very important. Also, this is probably where you have a strong tie with the pharma industry, that you define an endpoint. You can define your endpoints in terms of, uh, of the symptoms, but you can also define your endpoints in terms of uh, endophenotypes or surrogate endpoints, for example, like uh, the number of lesions you have, right? So that would be a surrogate endpoint. So here, some of the work we're doing here 
and this is uh, with, uh, with the colleagues in oncology as well. Uh, we are doing some work on monitoring treatment for brain cancer between two stages. You have a repeat visit at time one, you have a previous visit at time zero. You want to see whether this cancer has responded to treatment or has stayed the same. And radiologists have to face a lot of these repeat exams. It takes a long time for them, and so they're interested in automating this process as much as possible. Right, so all of these, you see that it really runs the gamut all the way, re really from image acquisition all the way to treatment monitoring. So this is machine learning. And uh, of course, when you do machine learning, what you want is you want more data, but a single hospital can only give you so much data. And so what you do is you need to combine data across hospitals. So there's two ways you can do this. One, you could do centralized, and then I'll talk about the federated case. So in the centralized here, we have one red hospital, one blue hospital. You put all the data together, and you have a purple database from which you train a, a model, right? So this model will be, you hope, will be good uh, because it has more data than a single center could provide. The problem, of course, course is that here you have a domain shift issue. I'll show you some examples uh, with images. But it means that maybe what you end up with is a model that is uh, not as good as an individual model. You have more data, but maybe now you drifted away from, from the blue center and you're kind of in the middle and nobody's happy about this, right? So this is a big issue. I talked about this last year. Essentially, you can do three things. You can adapt the data. Uh, I'll show you an example. You can adapt the training and you can adapt the model, right? So there's a number of, this is a really important topic in machine learning right now. There's whole workshops about this domain adaptation and domain shift. But in healthcare, it's not always easy to share the data. Often you have ethical problems, you have uh, ethics committee problems, I should say, that it's often difficult to share data between hospitals in a legal fashion. And this is a process that I know firsthand takes, you know, it can take a while, it can take six months. We had several, pro we had the project with COVID where one of the partners had to drop out just because it was impossible for the French partner, for example, to uh, sign the agreement that was allowing us to exchange data. So you have these things that it is, in fact, really a real problem to, to have this kind of thing. So what you can do instead is you could do a federated learning approach and do very briefly in a nutshell the blue center has their own data they train their own model the red center has their own data they train their own model and what you do is you then exchange the models uh, through the internet for example and you have a common model that you train from both so one of the classical algorithms I'll mention afterwards to do this is called federated average and so this black model here has been trained for uh, from uh, parameters of the models uh, seeing virtually seeing twice the amount of data if you want. So you send the model back, the, the average model back, and then you update the models regularly. You, dis you do this a number of times with convergence. If you're lucky, you're going to converge to a solution that is better than what you could have at any center. But this is not a given, right? So what you need to do probably is to adapt the training, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So in the rest of the talk, what I want to do is to show you uh, how you deal with this uh, centralized uh, approach, uh, how you deal with uh, heterogeneity in this case, and then how you deal with data heterogeneity in the federated learning case. So let's start with the centralized case. Here, to motivate the problem, I want to show the work from my PhD student, Veronica Rovano. She's jointly at EPFL and uh, Siemens. And here is about brain volumetry and Alzheimer's disease. So on the left uh, side here, you see a brain split in half. The left half of the brain is a healthy brain. The right side of the brain is an Alzheimer's brain. And you see this is, of course, a severe case. Uh, for the specialists out there, it's a BRAC stage 4. You see very, very severe atrophy uh, and severe atrophy, especially in the hippocampus. Okay? So this is something that is a very important imaging biomarker, is the volume of the brain, specifically some parts of the brain. So what you can do is you can do this uh, segmentation of the image automatically. That's what you see on the right. Uh, and so, for example, the blue part here on the right is the temporal lobe, and then the white part is the hippocampus. This is a part that is interesting. Okay, so now you can measure the number of voxels that are painted white, and then you have the volume of, the, uh, of, the, of this part of the brain. Good. The problem is this, that this is an image from scanner A, and this is an image from scanner B. So you see the contrast is completely different. If you look at the white matter, the part inside, and the gray matter, the part outside, you have much less contrast in the part of the brain. You see that you have inhomogeneities, etc. Okay, so of course you could try to deal with this uh, with uh, image processing methods, which of course we try to do. But the issue that it do, well, the issue you have is that you have then an error just due to this protocol change. You have the same software and you try to segment automatically, here's the type of error you, go, you get. You get 5% error on the volume of the hippocampus, 8% error on the cingulate, 10% on the deep white matter. It doesn't matter exactly what these parts of the brain do, but it might seem to you that 5% error is not too bad, right? We can live with that. The problem is that clinically, what you're interested in probably in Alzheimer's patient is the atrophy. 
And over one year, an Alzheimer's patient will lose approximately 1% of the volume of their hippocampus. But if your error is 5%, let's say you have this person, you scan them at one site, then they move to Geneva. Now you scan them in Geneva, and now you say you have 5% difference. You cannot say anything, right? So the noise is completely dominating the biological process here. So that's a huge problem. So here, what do we do? Well, we, you know, we like computer vision, so we're going to do some computer vision stuff. And so we take an approach called image-to-image -image translation. By the way, this is now very common to do, th to do this kind of stuff. And this is a model called the conditional GAN, Generative Adversarial Network. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar, but just in case, what you do is you take data from site A, and then you have a generator, the little cogs on the top, that try to generate data from site B. So this is essentially, you can think of it as high dimensional regression, tries to produce images from site B. And then you have another part of this network, the discriminator at the bottom here, and thus the job of the discriminator is to say whether the image you give it comes from site B or site A. And so each of these of these uh, machines is going to try to win. The discriminator is going to try to see whether you're giving it real data from site A or site B, and the generator is going to try to fool the discriminator. So you have this adversarial game, and that tends to converge to synthetic images that are much better than what you could do if you remove one of the parts of this network. So these networks work really well. Three, four years ago, they were really impossible to train. Now they're kind of routine. You can just download, and all the tricks have been done for you. So it's, it's kind of a nice... Um, it's kind of a nice tool. So just in detail, a little bit what we're, uh, what we're doing here. The loss function we're optimizing is a mixed loss function. This is the maximum. We're not optimizing exactly this, but just to show you a little bit. So we have an L1 loss that measures the absolute differences between the voxels intensities of site A and site B. We have an L2, which does the same thing, but penalizes high errors more. And then we have a nice uh, tool, which is called LPIPS. It's a perceptual um, similarity metric that basically tries to emulate the visual system of humans. So it tries to reproduce human value judgment saying, is this image the same as this one? And so this is an, uh, the reason we're doing it like this is that LPIPS is quite orthogonal to L1 and L2, uh, as we found, whereas L1 and L2 are quite correlated between themselves. So this is uh, a trial and error and also some theory behind this. But essentially, we have kind of a semi-complicated loss function from this. So here are the two protocols. Just to show you a little bit, the resolution is different. You have all these parameters that are different. We have uh, 74 patients that are paired. We use 64 for trading, and we just test on uh, 30 for the moment. And the results here, we have a few metrics, uh, mean, absolute, uh, mean absolute error, mean squared error, Wasserstein distance between the histograms. So all of these, you want them to be lower, so we succeed in getting them lower. And then we have also um, similarity metrics, the, the SSIM metric, uh, which you want higher, one being the images are exactly the same at, at a high level, and then PSNR, the signal-to-noise ratio. So we get improved metrics on all of this, so that's fine. But now it's not necessarily the case that this image similarity metric will give you the same volumes, right? Because remember, if we go back to our biomarker, what we want is the volume of some brain regions. And so what that does, uh, you can see these, uh, these images here with the two protocols at the bottom, and then you can see the segmentation is a bit different at the bottom. Uh, but bottom line, we reduce this error uh, from 5% to 3%, unfortunately not enough to be significant, so we need to have a larger data set here. The cow data is pretty good, the deep white matter is pretty good. It's still not something that I would consider solved, especially because we need paired data and this is just impossible like to get this paired data is just a nightmare like just to to scan people twice because these are patients right they don't want to stay twice the amount of time in the scanner right so um, this is still something that is in, in progress but it's at least promising overall we reduce a lot this variability that's fine but uh, i just told you that it's difficult to share data right and it is difficult to share data so what do we do in this case so here i want to switch gears and not talk about alzheimer's i just want to talk about stroke so this is mainly the work of uh, dr patinho lopez in my team who's a diffusion expert and i'll give you the bare minimum about diffusion imaging so diffusion imaging is a type of magnetic resonance imaging that is sensitive to the displacement of water molecules and here on top, you have a good protocol, if you want, which measures the diffusion in 21 directions. So you can see whether the water is going this way, this way, this way, this way. You have like a sphere, if you think, and these are all the directions that you're sampling. So if you want to have good like angular resolution to see where your water is flowing, okay? And why do we care about this? Because if you have white matter, for example, the water will propagate along this. If you have a CSF, a cerebral spinal fluid, water is just free, right? So you can see basically whether the structures are oriented or whether they're more, uh, they're more diffuse, right? So from this data, what you can do is you can summarize into this map called an ADC, apparent diffusion coefficient. So you see here the CSF is very bright because the water can diffuse almost freely, and then you can see differences between tissues. So this is a measure also, a rough measure of tissue integrity, right? 
And from this, you can apply a clinical threshold for stroke. So stroke is this disease where you have a clot that is a blockage in, uh, in the perfusion of your brain and some parts of your, your, your brain will essentially die due to lack of perfusion, lack of blood and lack of oxygen. And one uh, clinical, clinically proven threshold is this. So this is one way we just threshold this map and then this is the map that you get, right? So this red part is where the core is. So this is the infarct core. Based on this map and some other data, then the uh, clinicians can decide whether this person uh, is salvageable, so whether you can save some part of this brain or whether it's too late to intervene. The good thing is if you do this kind of stuff quickly, within 12 to maximum 24 hours, you can really save a lot of people. So there's been a tremendous amount of progress in stroke in the past, uh, in the past 10 years about this. So that's fine. Uh, this is one scheme, but this scheme is slow. So you could also have another diffusion scheme where you just look at three diffusions because each of these diffusions takes additional time and you don't want to lose people, you don't want to leave people too long in a scanner, right? So maybe one hospital has this one, but maybe another hospital has this one, right? So now you compute this and now you do the segmentation. So now let's see if you were at the other hospital, that's what you would get, right? So you see the red areas and the green areas are, are very different, right? Roughly speaking, they're on the same hemisphere, but uh, you see here that that's a problem, right? Because you're decision of where the core of the infarct is depends a lot on the protocol and there is no agreement between hospitals so now you want to do machine learning what do you do because that's basically you get hospital a gives you the map on top and hospital b gives you the map on the bottom to give you an id what we did is we simulated 14 different protocols and just for one patient this is to give you an id uh, roughly of what you get so the voxels with red all the protocols let's say all the hospitals said yes this part this part of the brain is infarcted. And the blue parts, only maybe one hospital out of 14 said, yes, this part is infarcted, right? So you see now that with this heat map representation, you see that you have huge variability in the location and the size of the infarct core across, uh, across the protocols, across the hospitals. So now if we do statistics on a bunch of patients, like 90, uh, 29 patients, sorry, for example, now the Jacquard coefficient is around 50%. So Jacquard of one means all the voxels are exactly the same. Jacquard of zero means zero percent of the voxels are the same. So 50% with a range of 5 to 85, it's horrible, right? So it, you really have a big problem here that if you want to, to do to, if you want to do any kind of machine learning with this. So, so this is just to, to sensitize you to this issue of like the, what, what's actually happening with, with, with the data. So there's low agreement. So now I just want to show you uh, one solution that we're playing with, and this is with our colleague uh, Richard McKinley and Sebastian Otalora at uh, Insel Spital. They have a very nice group uh, there with Roland Wist, a neuroradiology, that they do a lot of machine learning, but real with clinical problems like this. So this is a joint project we have with them. And this is on perfusion, so it's not diffusion, but perfusion, uh, but the, the principle is exactly the same. So this is the federated average, uh, the federated average classical machine learning uh, algorithm. Essentially, you have a big model. You give this big model to the clients. The clients do a little bit of updates. They send it back to the server, and then the server decides how to weight the different contributions from the different centers. Classically, what you do, this is the weighting term here. Right? So this is a site-specific weight. So what you will do, for example, is you could say, I will just, to get the big model, I will just reweight these individual site-specific models by the number of samples they have. So if a sample has, if a site has like say 20 patients, I will not take this into account too much, but if a site has 100 patients, I will take it into account more, right? So this is the classical federated average uh, formulation on top. So this NK over N, uh, this is, favors the majority site. And what we said is, okay, but that's a problem because maybe you have you know, a site that is not only doesn't have much data, but also that their protocol is very different, right? So you have two issues at the same time. You have heterogeneity and the imbalanced data problem. So what we tried is this beta weighting. So this is originally proposed for class imbalance problem. It's a very nice paper if you, uh, if you haven't seen it, but we thought, okay, you might as well apply it to the federated learning problem because it's also you know, kind, of, kind of a similar problem. And so this is the data set. This is from open data. Uh, we have uh, four vendors. I'll just focus on three here that are really different. Like if you look at these images, they're really completely different. So we have a total of 112. And here the metric that I'm going to show you is again a dice coefficient. So the dice coefficient, 100% is perfect, zero is horrible, and then uh, uh, anything uh, uh, no, higher is better here. So if you do the centralized here, because this is really noisy data, this perfusion data is another uh, horrible modality, there's a, there's a challenge about this, uh, we get around 40% dice. So this is not state of the art, the state of the art would be around 50. So we're n we don't have the best network yet for this. But if you do federated average, you, you drop down to 29, right? So this is quite a sizable 
global drop. And if you do this beta weighting thing, just by changing the weights, how you combine the sites, we think you can get it uh, better. You know, you get close to what you would get in a centralized. So that's always the goal, is to get as close as possible to the centralized, uh, to the centralized learning paradigm, right? So, and this is, of course, uh, not by far, uh, sorry, uh, not the only uh, way to do that. There's a number of algorithms that do that. So some of them actually from around here, like Scaffold, you have FedRod, you have a number of algorithms. So we're actually trying this in the case of segmentation uh, with uh, federated learning. And we're making progress every, so hopefully in a couple of uh, months we have uh, conclusions on this. But we think it's pretty promising that we can reach very close to, to centralized uh, if we take this into account. Okay. So to conclude uh, this talk about heterogeneous medical data, the first thing is that, as I've shown you, is really increases the variability of the biomarker for all applications. This is for all the applications I showed you for differential diagnosis, for uh, specific volumetry, for a prognosis, for everything. It really it messes up all the machine learning that you want to do. It's also a fact of life. So this is it indeed, it's not like clean research data. This is what you have in hospitals, especially in the case of acute care for acute stroke. Time is brain. You cannot just spend your time, oh wait, no, no, we'll do it again. Stop moving, please. You know, like, no, these persons are really in a bad shape, so you need to, to go fast. So you get images that people are cut, people move. So data is horrible. And there's no, you know, the, fortunately for us, the imaging quality keeps improving. But even within a hospital, like every three years, four years, like every year, actually, we have software improvements on these machines. Every five years, maybe we change the fleet. So data from five years ago is not really the same. It's much better today as five years ago, fortunately. But it also means you have a big shift, right? So that's a problem. The good thing is that you can uh, do it, you can actually deal with this in a centralized fashion. Um, but as I showed you, this was a paired uh, GAN that I showed. So an unpaired GAN, something like a cycle GAN uh, could also work, but it's going to be better, it's going to be more difficult to do. And so this is also something that, we, that we're looking at now. And uh, fortunately, it, you can also do this in federated learning. So now this is still a small data set, so I don't want to overextend the conclusion. But there's a lot of work, like in all the machine, you know, in ICL, in iClear, in uh, CVPR, and like in all the big uh, machine learning conferences, you see work on this domain adaptation. So in general, there is no reason why it wouldn't work on medical imaging. So if it works on cats and dogs, you know, it typically works on medical imaging, but not as good because we have 3D data, 4D data, 5D data, and we have much less, right? So uh, typically we have a gap always with what you see in nice uh, computer vision conferences. But uh, so much work remains, but we're hopeful. And uh, on the plus side, uh, this is a real test of model generalization ability. If your model works in my hospital, it works in your hospital, that's a good model, right? That's actually a plus uh, in the end. Uh, so to conclude, I think that if you can deal with this heterogeneous data, uh, then that's basically the keys to paradise because we have hundreds of thousands of images uh, in hospitals that are just waiting to be used uh, with, of course, ethical approval. Uh, but that's really uh, a goldmine there. So I just want to thank my team and the funders and you for your attention. <laughs>